because I think there are quite a lot of people around this table who want to have their turn in asking questions uh, and, and commenting. And I'm going to take a full round uh, and then come back uh, to you. Tim, and then we go around the table. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Tim Judah. I'm the Balkans correspondent of The Economist. Um, I, I just would like to raise this w with you, um, this question of uh, credibility, because I, I found that um, increasingly um, people that I talk to in the region, I'm, I'm talking specifically about the Western Balkans, uh, uh, many people feel that, um, uh, that, uh, that, the, that, that Brussels or that you have a policy which they would call um, stability before democracy, and they feel that um, democratic principles and the values that you're talking about are being sacrificed and certain things are being put under the carpet or not talked about because we're interested in preserving stability. And um, I mean, we talked, you mentioned CFSP, but for example, um, uh, what, two weeks ago, Serbia was mounting a campaign to defeat a, a, a resolution by a member state um, uh, at, at the UN for a very credible uh, purpose of condemning genocide at Srebrenica. But there was no kind of comeback for Serbia. But, uh, and um, there are, have been many kind of, how shall I put it, um, issues which have arisen, especially in Macedonia and in, in Kosovo over the last um, few months. Uh, at, 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 and the result has been that some people say, Oh, the people, oh, these things are being overlooked because of the, they're mo only interested in stability. So I just wanted to, to raise that. And I'll, well, I'll put that in the court. Thank you. Can I ask you please to put up your uh, name tags like this so I can see them? Irina, please. Thank you very much. I'm Irina Solonenko from Ukraine. I have a question to Ms. Mogherini about EU strategy towards Russia. So Ms. Kuneva implied that Russian citizens are sensitive to EU values, and she basically, I think, implied that there is a potential to change Russia from within. This could be an idea. And uh, <clears throat> Mr. Mito mentioned that uh, we should have understood Russia earlier when the Georgia situation happened. And maybe Ukraine is not the end of the story, and maybe we should do something now to prevent something worse from happening. So what I see now, basically, that the EU is actually reacting to Russia's action. Russia is setting the agenda, Russia is making steps, the EU is reacting. I don't see a strategy on the side of the EU. In Ukraine, many people say that maybe you should somehow draw the red line, and Russia should be communicated about the red, this red line, and know that beyond this red line, things will get much worse. More sanctions will be introduced, something else will be introduced on the side of the EU. What else? I don't know. So basically, yeah, is there a strategy? Is there thinking in this direction? Thank you. Okay, Gia. Um, I have a more general question. Uh, yes, I'm Gia Nodia from Georgia. I'm also a question to Ms. Mogherini uh, about this uh, issue, a little bit theoretical maybe, of relations between those mini games, which are not mini for some countries, and big picture. And I understand and being resigned to kind of somehow accepting the world where countries have to choose and there, are, there is competition, etc. And I understand that, of course, there is this big idea of European Union that this uh, Westphalian type of zero type game should be re uh, replaced by cooperation and win-win uh, uh, logic. Uh, uh, yes, but how do you imagine that uh, somehow actually happening when you have to deal with uh, actors, and certainly Russia is not uh, only of them, who don't believe in this uh, philosophy, or maybe they also believe in win-win uh, situation, but on different conditions, like I think people in ISIS would also believe in win-win after, after there is a global caliphate or something, and with that global caliphate, there will be win-win, but uh, the, the, how can, can you deal with that? I mean, I think one of uh, uh, thinkers of, on that issue, Robert Cooper, who also believed that eventually the planet sh can only be rescued if this if it's more or less transformed in the u image of European Union, so that this logic of cooperation becomes universal. Uh, that's, that's we should be moving f forward to, and I sh certainly share that, but until then, European Union is forced uh, to deal with those actors 
who don't believe in that logic and believe only in zero-sum competition and uh, uh, how practically can, uh, and, and he thought that uh, in, de in dealing with them, you have to, you are obliged or resigned to using those methods in order not to lose. <laughs> so how you imagine dealing with such actors uh, based on this kind of logic of cooperation and win win without power competition. Thanks. Please. Thank you very much. It's great to be in Sofia and and to see Sofia less shy, but assuming the role of original leader, leader that it should have assumed uh, even much more and should much more forcefully uh, assume in the future. Uh, just very quick questions. If you can introduce yourself. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm Leon Malazogu from Pristina. I run a think tank in Pristina. And first, uh, among the various countries assuming aspiring membership in the EU, there are some that see no alternative to the EU and some that do see alternatives to the EU. So I'm wondering, is there any difference in how the EU views uh, the, the roadmap of these countries towards the EU? And second, there are some societies, some countries that are willing sort of to undergo societal transformation and recognize the kind of path they need to do and some that sort of feel entitled to uh, just by the virtue of their being entitled to and, and in a way it becomes much more difficult to see the path of, of more societal changes that they need to undergo. And uh, I'm one of the believers that the true homework and much of the biggest homework lies within our own societies. So I, I don't have a tendency to blame the EU for lack of uh, integration. But I'm still wondering if, uh, if, this, if, there's, if the EU can do anything to speed up uh, the rhythm of transformations in these societies. And there have been many recommendations such as front-loading the screening and so on. So I'm just wondering if, if there's any, uh, any view in Brussels of a paradigm shift, sort of in a way, uh, so we need, and I'm against sort of entering before we're ready, as many are, Frankly, I think we should be ready before we enter, otherwise the conditionality will not apply and we will not, be, we will not change in the way we should change. But just is there any, any, any sense of how we can speed up all this? And just the last one is, there was an article in Pristina some time ago, and uh, do you at, at any times feel that uh, Russia's presence is not only felt in the Caucasus, but sometimes you can feel it and you can see it also in the Balkans, uh, currently and potentially as well. Great, please. Thank you very much. I will uh, relate to uh, Leon's questions. Maya Bobic from the European Movement in Serbia. Um, I really appreciated Mrs. Mogherini's uh, messages and uh, description of the enlargement process and uh, that it is really win-win and give-give uh, process because sometimes it seems there is really, from the perspective of the citizens and civil society, there is no true commitment from both sides. Our national governments who are doing the job, ticking the boxes just to be good pupils and to be praised from time to time from Brussels and from Brussels who is, you know, trying to keep up some stability uh, behind its borders, but not really being committed to integrating societies of the Western Balkans and seeing them as uh, part of the European family. Uh, I uh, relate to Leon's and, and maybe Tim's uh, questions because uh, we often see uh, uh, question that the European Union is not being very clear about in communicating the enlargement policy. I think this also derives from the problem that it is not clear in policy itself, or united uh, in, in this policy. We in Serbia also hear very different messages from different uh, European capitals. When it comes to Russia, when it comes to uh, Kosovo, when it comes to opening of the chapters, etc., it would really be useful to have more unity and clarity in policies and thus in communication. And finally, uh, the, the dominant feeling in the, in, the, in the Balkans, I think, is uh, sometimes that we are not uh, seen or feel uh, felt being wanted by the European, sincerely, <laughs> by the European Union itself. So it would be very useful in uh, developing very uh, important European policies like energy union, migration policies, etc., when developing the policy to include the accession countries, not only in monitoring the implementation, enforcement, etc., but to really uh, show, like in uh, the 10 countries in 2004, who, and Romania, Bulgaria, they, they were part of some processes even before becoming a member state. That would be very useful. Thanks. 
Thanks. Uh, I suggest you concentrate on one topic, all of you. Uh, I mean, each of them, <laughs> each of you, uh, because we don't have that much time, really. So it would be great if we got one question from each of you, please. Thank you, um, Haki Abazi from uh, Rockefeller Brothers One for Western Balkans. Um, yes, there are many issues we can talk. I think I will choose two things. I think one. Um, Two. One. They are interlinked. So I will insist not to be discriminated against. Um, there, th number one, I think we need to realize that the process of integration and transformation is happening actually with the same political structure that benefited from the war and benefited from the privatization of the publicly socially owned enterprises and those are the powerful of the Balkans that today make the fabric of the political process. Not all of them as individuals, but the disempowerment of the water and disempowerment of the democratic processes in the Balkans is evident. That's why I think we need, and, and I should say that we should appreciate highly the readiness of the European institutions to go vertically into the society and have a debate beyond the faces that can easily be met in capitals because that is where the problem is. Um, unfortunately, the, the functionality and the democracy of the political parties that later make the governments is a big question and it can very easily be a reversible process no matter what they agree in the process and we have seen that in Romania and Bulgaria as well. We cannot allow for that process to happen without a, an inclusion and a real participatory process. This can happen only if EU insists on the same standards of applying rule of law and justice in the Balkans, because otherwise the powerful and the rich are being able to marginalize, and that brings me to the second point. I think and I fear we're losing the battle of losing the brain from the Balkans. It's not only refugees from Africa and Asia, is the brain of the Balkans, especially Western Balkans, that is leaving the country because there are two choices. Either join the criminal enterprise, political systems, or leave and try to be, uh, live with the dignity and intellectual uh, networks in, in Europe. The speed is not only to transform us, the speed is actually to win the battle of losing this great brain that has been created in this window of opportunity of 20 years of peace in the Balkans. Thanks a lot. Just be aware that you're then uh, reducing the time of your colleagues afterwards. Actually, there is a third option to join the criminal networks inside the European Union. <laughs> Anka. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anka Mihalake. I work for a Bucharest-based think tank, Energy Policy Group. Uh, predictably, my question is about energy and how the European External Action Service is going to use this tool. Whether, because if we look at things very pragmatically, energy in most of cases serves not so much to create cooperation so as to divide, and we need to look no further than what South Stream and currently Turkish Stream are doing to countries inside the European Union. Uh, but of course, it can also serve as an incentive for cooperation if properly used. What I'm asking is, how is, uh, or both, it can be used, it can be seen both as an obstacle or as an incentive. What I'm asking is, how, these, how is the European External Action Service seeing it, and how it goes about addressing it? If it sees it as an opportunity, how it will go about seizing this opportunity, and if it's seen as an obstacle, how it goes about solving this obstacle in its path. Thank you. Thanks. Uh... Julian Popov just wrote a piece about this, so I'm going to give the floor to him very briefly. Not to reply to the question, but to, to ask your question. I was just going to say that, that I, I had gladly given my um, question to Haki, but since... since um, uh, my question, yes, my question is linked with, uh, specifically with the Energy Union. I mean, the Energy Union is... is uh, a key uh, policy of the European Union, and it is very much an external policy. I mean, that's how it was triggered. And I'm sure that uh, Minister Mitov um, um, boasted about the Bulgarian role in actually integrating the Western Balkan countries using the platform of the Energy Union through the high-level group for um, gas interconnectivity. 
And uh, the same thing could be extended in a way to Turkey because we always talk about the, uh, the way the Turkey uh, energy chapter is closed and blocked and it's not going to, to go further. But the energy union provides a perfect platform for full integration of Turkey into the energy discussions and plans of the European Union. So my question is, do you uh, see that as an option? Thanks. Hedvig. Hedvig Morva, European Fund for the Balkans from Belgrade. Um, it's, it is clear that somehow the EU integration process in the Balkans needs a, a, a new energy. So would it be possible to somehow introduce some new carrots in addition to the sticks, to the existing sticks, meaning to somehow um, introduce some benefits which could be associated uh, with the process uh, even prior to actually joining, uh, recalling, of course, the visa liberalization as a great incentive. I know that it cannot be repeated, but is there an idea how uh, the benefits could be somehow phased uh, in the process? Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm Dimitri Ciantafilou from Kadir Hassist University in Istanbul, a Greek in Turkey. So my question has to do a little bit, I mean, as we go through this review process, game changers. And I see in this wider region, I mean, we, uh, the wider region of the Balkans, of the Black Sea region, the Eastern Partnership, and maybe the Mediterranean, two possible game changers in the couple uh, coming years. One is something we spoke in the previous session, maybe a rapprochement between Turkey and Armenia, Normali not ra rapprochement, normalization of relations. So how would this possibly have, have an impact and what the EU could do. And the second one is Cyprus. And, and, and Cyprus issue is very interesting again, because if there is a resolution, it impacts directly on Turkey's relations with the European Union, and not only on Turkey's relations with, the, uh, Turkey's relations with Greece in that, state, in that sense, and also has an implications maybe for the Balkans, right? Take Kosovo. Maybe Greece and uh, Cyprus would consider the question of Kosovo's independence differently once that issue is resolved. So, and, and, and obviously, it has a direct impact on what the EU could do. I mean, the, the, the commission uh, president was just there in Cyprus. So I, I wonder whether one should factor these in. Because, you know, at the end of your round of conversation, it was, you know, talking about migration, which is a very real issue. But there's potential out there for EU foreign policy to, to really have an impact and, and to consider what these game changers are uh, in terms of relations in the region, in particular... The question Turkey's, is clear. Let me finish. Turkey's accession process. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, okay. Thank you, Rana. Thank you very much. Uh, Adelina. Adelina Marini, um, journalist here inside. Um, the word trust has been mentioned so many times that I couldn't help thinking of Greece all the time. But in the context of the Western Balkans and what Mrs. Mogherini said, keep the other side interested, made me think, um, okay, I agree that the um, five-year freeze of enlargement is a wrong narrative, but isn't it high time that the EU would reassess not only the enlargement approach, but also to reassess its mistakes and good things that it did. Because in 10 years, we saw what happened in Macedonia. While waiting for an issue to be resolved, Macedonia from a front runner has turned into a country that needs EU facilitation. In the same time, Croatia joined with uh, almost no problems. So isn't it time the EU would reassess what it did, what it did not do, um, and try and come up with a different strategy that would accommodate the existing uh, new realities, because things have dramatically changed ever since the last enlargements happened. Thank you. Thanks a lot, a Bosnian voice. Alida. Thank you. Alida Vrac, uh, Think Tank Populari Bosnia. Uh, my question goes back to the strategy that we're discussing today. Uh, would it be possible to sort of integrate in parallel uh, development of this strategy with 
foreign uh, policy strategies and security strategies in the Western Balkans. What I mean concretely is uh, that we in the Western Balkans have really outdated documents. They don't really correspond to anything that is happening in the world. I can speak for Bosnia, that is a four-page document produced in 2004, very general document that, that could be, in a way, part of this story, not only Bosnia, but Serbian, Montenegrin, and others, just as an idea. Thank you. Thank you very much. Richard, and then the lady next to you. Thank you very much for the time and the patience. I'm actually an Armenian-American running a think tank in Armenia, working with Commissioner Hahn, where we have a rare second chance to salvage a relationship. But my question and concern is more about your recent victory, the strategic breakthrough with Iran as a real game changer. And in many ways, in order to sustain the momentum, your visit next week. Fortunately, much of your accomplishments have been bolstered by Maya, Stewart, and your staff in terms of demonstrating that the status quo can be changed. Is there, specifically regarding Iran, as the demonstration of the EU's strategic significance in this changing environment, is there a way to leverage that synergy, whether toward the neighbors of neighbors, the Eastern Partnership, and actually a rare case where the breakthrough with Iran happened also because of Russia, not despite Russia. Thank you. Zvezdana Kovac, Center for Democracy and Reconciliation in Southeast Europe. Uh, talking about uh, enlargement and about the ways how to become a member of European Union uh, family, Ms. Mogherini mentioned that the mentality, uh, especially in Western Balkans Europe, uh, countries, has to be changed. Uh, she also, you also mentioned the lack of uh, European Union spirit. Uh, we know that mentality is almost impossible to be changed entirely and that wouldn't be nice because then the, the, the beauty of uh, difference would disappear. But uh, uh, to what extent you think that that mentality has to be changed and how? Thank you. Okay, we have very little time. We're behind schedule. Croatian question is what we have been missing. Uh, thank you. I will be very brief. Senator Shilashavich from Croatia. I would like now, in the end, actually to reiterate Tim Judas' question, which was in the beginning, and I hope you will not forget to answer that, because I think it's crucial. Do we or does the European Union care more about stability rather than democracy? And I take the Bosnian example. Uh, European Union has offered the European Initiative for Bosnia-Herzegovina. It was adopted by the European Union first and then hoped to be adopted by Bosnian leaders. Once they adopted it, it took months to sign the declaration. And now that the declaration has been signed, only one piece of paper, we have been waiting for months for Bosnian leaders agree to agree uh, with the European Union to start the reforms uh, in their own country. So the question is, can European Union care more about the European prospect of Bosnia-Herzegovina than Bosnia-Herzegovinians themselves? And I'm not saying this because I don't, I'm also a citizen of Bosnia-Herzegovina, so I'm say, saying this as a citizen. Um, and the question is not how many more, um, 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 not, not how many more gifts or what the European Union can give more to, to uh, these countries, but what are the sticks? Where do we draw the line? Because maybe if European Union has more stomach for instability, and that doesn't need to mean that it does it changes the, the um, um, process of elections or not engage with elected leaders, but if there is no agreement, can European Union simply say, we stop talking to you and we see what happens? Do less rather than do more and change the strategy, what Mrs. Marini was talking about. Uh, Daniel Smilov has uh, a Bulgarian on this table. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Well, uh, m my question is uh, to the panel as a whole. So the, let's imagine for a second that in four years, uh, all uh, Western uh, Balkan countries are ready for membership, that they have met all conditionalities and so on. Uh, 
Uh, my question is, is the European Union going to be ready to accept new members at all? So what will, will be uh, uh, the internal dynamics in, uh, in the European uh, Union uh, in these four years? Because there is a referendum in the UK coming up. And actually, uh, my feeling is that we cannot uh, take up uh, uh, the European Union as a, a kind of stable rock in, in, in this uh, rather complex uh, world anymore. So thank you.